turn to Genesis uh, 32 and just leave it open on your lap through the course of my message today. You won't have to be fiddling around then trying to find it later. My message, the pursuit of the righteous, the pursuit or, or the race of the righteous, the pursuit, the seeking, the running, the race of the righteous. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your goodness. And I thank you for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And most of all, we thank you for the truth that sets men free. I pray for your unction, your anointing on me this morning and upon the word, sanctify me. Let truth prevail. Let truth stir our hearts. Lord, it's only the truth that sets us free. It is truth delivered by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, lay hold upon me, my lips, my mouth, my mind, my body, and give us ears to hear what the Spirit has to say in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul tells us that this Christian walk is a race. And he said, we're all running with one goal, and that goal is to win. Paul said, so run that you may be able to obtain. That means to win. Now, there's nothing sinful about running to win the race. Paul also said, I run not with uncertainty, but to obtain the prize that's set before me. Now, before we talk about the prize, let's talk about the kind of race you're running. Now, the older I get, and the longer I walk with God, the more I'm convinced that there are two races that Christians are involved in. There is the spiritual race, and there's the race of the flesh. Flesh versus spirit. Now, if I were to ask most Christians, they'd say, well, I know what race I'm in. Because I love the Lord, I'm in the spiritual race. I'm not in the flesh race. Well, let's find out. Search it by the scripture this morning. Now, I travel the world, and I, I speak to thousands of ministers and to crowds, mass crowds of people everywhere we go. But I find the majority of pastors, a majority of believers are restless. They're dissatisfied. They have not come into the rest and the peace of God. And they are not running the right race. They're not running the race that Paul's talking about. They're not pursuing the right prize. Now, the prize of the high call, the spiritual race, the prize you know is Christ and Him crucified, the revelation of Christ, growing in Christ. The prize of the flesh race is success. And it doesn't satisfy because there's no end to the search. You get to a certain point, you throw your stake further out and out, and it ends, what Paul says, in shipwreck. He said, lest having preached to others, if I'm in the wrong race, I'm preaching to others, and I myself become a castaway because I am not seeking the real prize. He, he said, I'm a castaway. Now, castaway is one who survived a shipwreck. And he's stranded now. He's out in the ocean, maybe in a lifeboat. He's by himself. And that's what Paul's saying. Lest I be left out adrift, that I have no direction, that I have no rest, I have no peace. I'm like a person that's just drifting, and, I, and I'm left alone in this. I keep my body or my flesh under, and I bring it into subjection. Lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself become a castaway. If we could look into the spiritual realm, and if we could see these two races, and you could see all of those that are taking this track, this racetrack toward success and self-meaning. In other words, trying to do something, trying to find something to give them self-worth so they feel that they're not living in vain, that, that I have something to live for. Now, folks, we as Christians are to live for Christ he is to be our total satisfaction, whether we're able to achieve anything or not, whether we're unknown, and when nobody knows us, we feel like we're not accomplishing anything, that our growth is in Christ. And you can have as much knowledge as Christ as you desire. You can be the most unknown person on the face of the earth and be the most educated in the things of God. And eventually, though you will be seen and you will be heard 
when God wants you to be seen and heard, and he will do it in a fruitful way. But if you could look in the spiritual realm and you, you see the other race, this, the, the, the flesh race, you would find exhausted people laying on both sides of the racetrack. You would see them absolutely exhausted, trying to find something that, that they can show to people. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> About four, over probably 40 some years ago, the Lord moved upon me to start Teen Challenge, a drug ministry for, for drug addicts, alcoholics. We started as Teen Challenge, but then, uh, it is Teen Challenge, but we started as uh, teenage evangelism. Then we saw a lot of adults coming in who were drug addicts and alcoholics <clears throat> called Teen Challenge. And I've watched over the years many drug addicts, alcoholics coming and get genuinely saved and filled with the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> And some of them would go to Bible school. And they would come home from Bible school on fire for God. And they would be taken into staff members. This is all over the world. There are over, over 500 of these centers now in the United States and around the world, even in Siberia. And I've watched these young men become directors of their programs eventually. And they start out with great humility, faith in God, praying men. They even have to pray in for their food money for the guys, and they, they pray in for money for the lights and the electricity and the heat. And they, they really become men of God, but something happens to many of them. Now, I want to tell you, the majority of them are godly men, well-balanced men of prayer. But I've seen too many of them shipwrecked because they started the wrong race. They got seduced into the wrong race. They got so busy witnessing and you can do this. You can be so busy working for God, you forget who he is, and you don't spend time with him, and you drift away. And you become shipwrecked. You become a castaway, as Paul said, adrift out here, just working and losing touch with God. And I've watched them over the years. When they get so busy, they have no time for family. They get so busy, they're not praying, they're not seeking God anymore. And they leave themselves open as a prey to the enemy. And, and then, rather than then Christ is the object and the prize, it's success. It's wanting to be known and heard. And I watch them, they go to gatherings, they go to conferences of all the leaders of these programs, not just Teen Challenge, but all of these other drug programs, and they have conferences all over the world. And I've watched them go to these conferences, and, 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 and I, it goes something like this, hey brother, what's God doing at your place? How many guys do you have? How many patients do you have? And, and do you have a girls program? I've got a girls program. Do you have a girls program? Well, no, I don't have, but I have 50 guys. And, and I'm starting a children's program. We're going to reach teenage drug addicts. And another brother says, hey, what's your budget? How much... How many buildings you have? And, and it's, it begins buildings. It begins finances. It begins comparing themselves with one another. And some of these guys have, some of these men have little programs, 10 or 12, and they, they just have one building, and sometimes it looks no more than a shack in some of the countries. And, and I wonder how they can even live in some of these dwellings. But, but they're happy. They were happier there. But they go to these meetings, and they hear and see and compare themselves with others. Then they go back to their little ministry and they get all excited and work everybody up and they get busy trying to make something happen so that somebody, and, and the question should not be how many guys do you have, how many girls do you have, but what is Christ doing in you? It's how are your kids growing in the Lord? And I've watched in sadness as many of these have gone back to drugs and to alcohol and to pornography and suicide because they were seduced into the wrong race. The prize was no longer Christ, but self-fulfillment. Self-fulfillment. In other words, something to show to people where they can say, what a man of God, what a ministry, what a great work. <clears throat> that is the flesh race. Now, God is not against success. Paul said, he that ploweth, the scripture says, he that ploweth should plow in hope. If you're a businessman, you should expand, you should invest as God leads you, and you should go after 
by using your talent, by following Christ and being led by the Holy Spirit, you, you should expand, you should plow with hope. If you're in a job, you should strive lawfully. It's being led by the Holy Spirit to the best position, the highest paid job you can get. God is not against success. If you're in the ministry, God wants you to have fruit. He wants you to grow. He is not against that kind of success. What God is against is success at the cost of compromise. Compromising the word of God. If you grow, if you try to seek a goal and you compromise the word of God, you are on the wrong course. You're headed toward the wrong race and the wrong prize. You're headed toward being a castaway in a shipwreck because you have not taken God at his word. Most of us take only the promises. And we don't take the woes and bewares. No, folks, I believe in the woes as well as the well-beings. Oh, that was a weak amen. You compromise God's word one iota, and you're in the wrong race. Now, at Pentecost, in the early days in the first church, the word there was preached without compromise. Not one iota of the word was compromised. In fact, they preached such a convicting message, so, uh, the Bible says, so pricking in the hearts of the hearers, they fell on their faces and cried, what should we do to be saved? No compromise of the word of God. At Pentecost, that first church, they preached repentance, resurrection, holiness, atonement through the blood. They were not embarrassed by the true manifestation of the Holy Spirit. They were not ashamed of the scars of Christ. They preached healing. They laid hands on the sick and they were healed. They believed that the dead could be raised. They believed that the deaf could hear and the blind could see and the lame could walk because it was the word of God. And they would not compromise on that. But when you get to Galatians, you begin to see compromise and the word of God creeping into the church, the first church, the early church. Can you imagine today how it is? Peter went down to Antioch to preach to the Gentiles. And while he was there, he ate with them. He fellowshiped with them. Now the Jews in Jerusalem, in the church of Jerusalem, first Pentecostal church, this is where the touring of the Holy Ghost began. And yet there were... There, were, there was a party of believers that are called the circumcision. They brought in a teaching that you were saved by faith, yes, but you had to add circumcision. If you weren't circumcised, you couldn't go to heaven. You weren't really saved without circumcision. And they still did not believe that it was permissible for a Jew, even a believing Jew, to associate with the Gentile because the Gentiles were still dogs in their sight. They were called dogs. And you didn't eat with them, especially you didn't fellowship with them. And they had this click within the, in the church. And Peter is down in Antioch preaching the Gentiles. And he, he's, happy. He's, he, he's associating with them. He's eating with them, fellowshipping with them. And here comes a delegation from Jerusalem into Antioch who were of the circumcision party. And when they arrive, they are aloof from these people, and when they eat, they go and set up their own tables. And Paul, uh, Peter, who'd been over here eating every day with the Gentiles, this group from Jerusalem were watching Peter. So Peter goes over. He leaves the table of the Gentiles and goes to the table of the Jews. These were spirit-filled Jews. And, and Paul, Paul was shocked, absolutely shocked. And he rebukes Peter openly. And the Bible says, he, Peter withdrew, fearing them which were the circumcision. You see, some people don't maintain their race in the prize of Christ because of fear. 
You even ha- you you have to face the possibility of losing your job. There, there's there's always an opportunity to take a stand. This was time for Peter to take a stand for those in Jerusalem saying, "No, this is wrong." But Peter was afraid. He, he didn't want to offend the circumcision group. He didn't want to offend them, and so he compromised. He compromised the word of God. And Paul said, Peter, you're not ministering uprightly. In, in, in so many words, he said, you're not ministering uprightly according to the truth of the gospel. You and the circumcised people are compromising. This is not, in, in essence, what Paul was saying to Peter. Peter, you know this is hypocrisy. You know this is not the gospel you preached in the upper room. You know this is not according to the truth of God's word. This is this is a watered down gospel. You're afraid to depend. You're afraid to, to to offend people. You're afraid of that, and you're compromising. Peter, this is not the gospel that saved you. This is not the gospel that filled you with the Holy Ghost. This is not that gospel. He said, no, this, this is another gospel. You're talking about another Christ. Folks, God forbid the day ever come that there be any compromise in this pulpit. No preacher should ever be on a soapbox expressing his own feelings. And I have to fight that. I have to, I have to admit to you, I fight that. I have to go over every note and I have to stand before the pulpit and say, oh God, am I on a soapbox? Am I just trying to express something negative in my own soul? But there comes a time. What happens? I, I told the Lord, Lord, I don't want to. I don't want to preach anything negative anymore. I want to be positive. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Yeah. And if Paul didn't take his stand, you wouldn't be here today. You wouldn't be here because the church would have gone the way of the circumcision. And God says, I'll not let any flesh, glo- any flesh, glory in the flesh. I'll not let any believer glory in the flesh. So that's why I'm preaching it today. Paul called it dissimulation. Another word for compromise, fear of offending people. Now, Paul's not calling Peter a phony. He loved this man. He he knew that Peter was one of the greatest soul winners in the church. He knew he was a praying man. He knew that he just walked the street one time and even his shadow people were healed. He had great respect for this man, but he, he had a great respect for the word of God. He said, we cannot compromise the word of God. Peter, you're embracing those who were offended over the gospel of full surrender to the victory of the cross. He said, you, you see, you're trying to please men's flesh. You're afraid of man. And you just, you want to be accepted by, the, by, by these. And the, these who are preaching circumcision plus Christ are not according to the word of God. It's hypocrisy. He said, I'm not going to call it by any other name. I love you, Peter, but you're wrong. You're compromising. Peter told the Galatians, I'm amazed that you're so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ and now to a different gospel. And some are trying to distort the gospel of Christ. Now, friends, there's horrible abominable distortion of the gospel of Jesus Christ in churches all over the world. I see it everywhere we go. Total distortion of the word of God. People, uh, uh, pastors even, uh, building great churches but afraid to offend anybody. So they're preaching a compromising gospel. Now, folks, I, I am not knocking every church because I have, I have seen churches of 10,000 and, and large congregations with a man of God in the pulpit preaching truth. Th- this is a mega church. But folks, and I'm, I'm not here, I'm not the judge, but the word of God is. And I'm, I'm nothing but a vessel, I'm nothing but a voice speaking and, and following in the footsteps of Paul the Apostle. I'm not an apostle, I'm not a Paul. But I can read what he says and I can read what this word says and judge myself first. And I believe the Holy Spirit is grieved, grieved by what is being preached in many pulpits today. You see, where the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of the Lord and the presence, there's a weightiness of the Spirit. 
There's no lightness. There's a weightiness. There's a soberness about the presence of Christ. The very powerful presence of Christ brings a sense of awe. Tremendous awe. The Holy Spirit will not manifest the presence of Christ where there's foolishness, where there's frivolity, where there's a mockery of the old hymns of the church, where there's a lightness concerning the gospel of Jesus, where there's compromise with the gospel. You cannot find the Spirit of Christ there. Jesus will not manifest his presence where the old paths that have been proven over the years are mocked. I listen to young pastors get up and mock, even mock the Holy Ghost. I, I heard of one just recently stood up mocking, standing mocking tongues in the pulpit. And, and, and you, you listen to these brash men who stand up and joke about the old timers. In one country we were at, I preached a message, the Holy Spirit just put on my heart that God needs you 65 years old and older to pastors. And I saw pastors over 65 weeping everywhere and they came forward after service. They came to me and said, Brother David, don't you understand why the Holy Ghost laid that on your heart? Here in this country, the young men say, we don't need anybody over 60 anymore. We don't need these old men because God's doing a new thing. That's mockery. That's apostasy. There are men developing new methods and they're sunning it like merchandise. Making merchandise of the things of God. They bring in movies now to illustrate their sermon. On the screen above me, for example, they would play movies from the theater. They'll take film clips out of movies that Christ is cursed in. The name of God taken in vain. And put it on the screen to illustrate their sermon. Do you think the Holy Spirit's going to come in that kind of a meeting? It's the compromise of the Word of God, not in the pulpit, but in our heart. The Lord will not manifest Himself in the heart of any so-called believer who, who has this lightness, this lack of awe and respect for the things of the Holy God. They mock preachers that preach against sin. They've taken the blood out of their choruses and their songs. No blood mentioned anymore. No mention. Don't dare mention the soon return of Jesus Christ. That's all in the past. Because it offends. You see, you can draw crowds with that. But what a day of judgment will be if any man... Hearing me now, anywhere on the face of the world, he wants nothing but crowds. And I don't care if you get 20,000 people. I don't care if your parking lot stretches a mile wide long. You've got thousands of cars and traffic jams. If you're not preaching a complete gospel, if you compromise one iota of the world, of the thing you're going to stand before God with a multitude condemning you on the judgment day because you denied them the word of God. Now I want to talk to you about the prize of the spiritual race in Jesus Christ. This race is the most difficult and few that want to run it. The scripture says the way is narrow. Jesus said the way is narrow and few that be on that road. In other words, my course is a narrow cross, course. And he said there are few that want to go this way. Now I'll tell you why. Because this race leads you face to face with God. Face to face with Christ. This race will take you to a place called Peniel. It's called the face of God. And this is where Jacob wrestled with the Lord. He called the place Peniel. God's face. You see, it's 20 years. I want to explain this race the spiritual race and the prize in Christ. 20 years ago, he supplanted his brother. Supplant means to remove a man from his position and take his position. It means to 
push one man away and move into his place of authority. He was supplanted. He supplanted his brother Esau. It's 20 years since he met God at a place he later called Bethel. He's running from his brother. His mother sends him to her brother's place, Laban's house, far away. He goes about 60 miles that first day, 100 kilometers. And he lays down at night, takes some stones and puts his blanket against it as a pillow. And that night in a dream, he sees a heavens open and a ladder from heaven. Remember the story? Angels ascending and descending, and he, he has, he's face to face with the Lord. There's a theophany. No, God's a spirit. No man can see him, but somehow God revealed himself face to face with Jacob. And, and, and Jacob says, if you will bless me, I'll serve you as God. I'll let you be God to me. You'll be my God. And he made a covenant with God. You bless me. You protect me. And, and you, you see, that's all he's thinking right now because he's a young man. He's, he's a young believer. God doesn't expect much out of these first-time young believers who are first receiving their revelation. God wouldn't expect out of you what he would expect out of me or somebody who's walking with God for years. But he, he's saying, if you just bless me, you can be God to me. You can be my God. And just 20 years later now, he's not seen Esau for a moment. And he's now God told him, go back, go back to your family. Go back to your country. And I'll protect you. I'll go with you. And here he is now at a place he calls Peniel by the Javik River. And he sends word ahead that he's coming and Esau gets it. And Bessie comes back and said, Esau is coming with an army of 400 men and he's racing toward you. And, and Jacob is petrified. An army of 400 men and all of his past sins are raiding against him now. And all the 20 years of cheating and supplanting and all of these things that he did in his flesh. His flesh was in control for 20 years. You see, you, you, you can have a revelation of the Lord and you can have a wonderful experience of conversion. But if you don't pursue the heart of God, if you don't let him be God to you, and if you're going to take matters in your hands all the time, you're not going to consult with God. You're living in the flesh. And so the Lord creates a crisis. This was God's doing. And Jacob still, even though God said, I'm going to be with you, trust me, he's still devising plans. He's still trying to get himself out of the predicament. Does that sound like something familiar to you? You say, oh, I trust God. Oh, I, the Lord's done so many things in the past. How could I doubt him now? And here you are in a crisis, and you're not concerned. You're making your own plans, trying to figure out how to get out of the problem you're in right now. Now, don't look at me like that. You know what I'm talking about. So look like little puppies. Uh, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. He devises a plan. He's going to send, he's going to divide into two camps. He's going to take the least love, that's Leah, and her children and her handmaidens and, and, and half his cattle and his, his donkeys and his camels. He's going to just flood. He's going to have group after group of cattle. He's going to try to bribe his brother. He's got a plan all figured out. I'll soften him because... He's thinking he, he's, he's a carnal man because I got him on his carnality once, I'll get him again. And so he sends Leah out ahead. And, he's, he, and then here comes his beloved Rachel. They're both wives to him. And Joseph, one of the favorite sons, and a whole bunch of cattle here. And he, he said, if, if Esau kills the first group, that'll give time for Rachel and Joseph to escape. Quite a plan. You see God in it? 20 years? 20 years after a vow, I'll let you be God to me? 20 years. How many Christians go for years and years living in flesh? Never consulting God. Never yielded to the Holy Spirit. 
never letting him take full control. And the Bible says in Joseph, or, or, or rather, <clears throat> and Jacob was left alone. He's left alone. And in that lonely moment, there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of day. Jacob said it was God who was wrestling with him. He said, I have seen God face to face. Now, we know that this is an inner battle because God is a spirit. And I, I don't know how he appeared. I don't know if there's some kind of manifestation of Christ before uh, he came to this. I don't know what it is. But he said, I, this was God dealing with me. Now, God arranged this crisis. And I want to tell you, if you're a man or woman of God, and you're seeking the Lord, you want to walk in the Spirit, and you want to be pleased God, you want the fullness of Christ, you're going to be brought one day to the same crisis where things are taken out of your hands, when you can't do anything about it. You're in a situation now that no amount of things you do, no thinking power, no nothing of your wits, nothing. And God created this crisis. God brought him to this place. Because he's saying in so many words, Jacob, I love you so much, I will not let you destroy yourself. I'll not let you live your whole life living by your wits. I want you to live a dependent life, dependent upon me, dependent on the Holy Spirit. Jacob, I brought you to look at yourself. Look inside your heart and see what's happened to you. And he said, and the Lord said to him, what's your name? What's your name? In other words, what have you become? What, who are you really? And he said, my name is Jacob. What did he say? My name is the planter. Now, I want you to listen to the issue. The issue is not about supplanting Jacob now because that was 20 years ago, and when the Lord appeared in heaven, he was showing him. Now, he is just fresh from his sin, and the Lord forgave him on the spot. He said, I'm going to bless you. And he was forgiven way back at Bethel, 20 years before. And when God forgives, he forgets. Long ago, he forgot Jacob's supplanting Esau. He said, no, this is what the issue is. Jacob, you supplanted me. You removed me out of my place of authority. You've taken matters in your own hand. You have replaced me as the Lord of your own life. And he said, I won't have it, Jacob, because I love you. And that's what happens. He will bring you. He will allow you to come to a place where you will either yield or you will run off and say, and, and folks, when you're in that crisis, you're going to hear every voice imaginable. You're going to have everything of your past thrown at you. Your flesh will bring up every failure, every sin you've ever committed. He'll tell you you are a failure. And I believe this is what happens to Job here now. Because you know when he's wrestling, they, there's not one word about his sin. He's already replayed all that. He's not asking for deliverance. There's not one word about saving his own skin. Not one word about Leah and, and Rachel now. Do you see the focus has changed? Because he's face to face with God. And this time there's no escape. God says once and for all, I want you to have a changed heart. A changed heart. Folks, that's what God is wanting out of all of us, a changed heart. Now, we were changed at salvation. He gave us a new heart. But I'm talking about a believing, trusting heart. I'm talking about a dependent heart. Oh, we talk about this, but we don't seem to arrive. We don't even begin to understand trusting God. And there comes a time when you'll be tested. And you... You will hear the voice of the flesh saying, God has passed you by. If people only know what you were, if people only knew who you are, you'll hear the voice of your flesh saying, You're a phony. 
And you'll hear all kinds of voices from the enemy, and you'll, you'll hear it from the flesh. God is not answering your prayer. God doesn't even hear you when you fast. Look around you, what's happening? You, you, you're a failure. You're a failure. Everything you do turns to dust. You'll hear that from the flesh ringing in your ear. But you see, God's trying to bring, bring you to a place where he can smite your flesh. And the Lord starts just that way before he'll even talk to this man again. He touches him and puts his hip out of joint. God says, I'm going to cripple your flesh. I'm going to make it so you can't run fast anymore. I'm going to make it so that you have to depend on me for your next step. You, you, you say, say, but Brother Dave, Pastor Dave, didn't God say your prince, you prevailed? Let me tell you how he prevailed. What did Jesus say to Paul the Apostle? My strength, Christ is speaking, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. How did he prevail? By having his flesh smitten and become totally dependent on the Lord. The power was in dependency. Oh, can't you see it? Doesn't mean that he was some great wrestler. How does a wrestler, how does a man that's crippled and he can't even walk have power? But Bible says the the Lord said, Let me go. You know what that says? He's just holding on. He's just clinging. He's like a wrestler that knows he's going down unless I'm having he's just holding on. Folks, that's all you can do. Hold on to Jesus. Hold on. Cling to Jesus. Say, Lord, I'm going to trust you. This is beyond me. I don't know what to do. Lord says, hold on. You say, well, he said, let me go. Well, that, that's because the Lord had already achieved what he wanted to achieve in this man. He said, your name is no longer Jacob. Because something's happened here today. Something's happened. You've seen the futility of walking in your flesh. Now you've laid hold of the prize. Now you're on the right racetrack. And he said, you have, you have prevailed. You have power with God and power with man. Now, let me tell you what the name stands for. Yes, it means prevailing. All of those things, Israel. But the root word for Israel, one of the root words is God governs. God governs. God says, now, Jacob, I'm in control. From now on, you're going to trust me. You're going to believe that I lead you and guide you, that I'll never forsake you. That's the moment you and I prevail. I'm going to close with this. Tuesday night, here at this, in this pulpit, a man came from Europe, a great man of God, who 10 years ago was healed, full of cancer, given up to die, and the Lord healed him. He's a Lutheran pastor. He's received the Holy Spirit. And as soon as the Lord healed him, he started praying for the sick. Thousands came. Many come from all over the world. And when, when we were in that country recently, Gary preached in his church. He came here Tuesday to see me backstage. I said, Pastor Dave, for 10 years I've been praying for the sick. And I, I, many thousands have been healed. I've been traveling the world. And God's healing everywhere I go. But he said, the cancer's returned. I'm full of cancer. And the doctors don't give me any hope. And he said, my question has been why? Why in the middle of a great revival? Why, while well, I'm seeing so many people here, why now am I told that this is hopeless? Full of cancer. I said, sir, my dear brother, I can't give you an answer. I don't know why. But we're going to pray for you. And if you were here Tuesday, the elders prayed, joined me, and we prayed for this dear man. And he told me backstage, and he just mentioned it here in the pulpit. He said, you know, I've been seeking the Lord, trying to ask why. And all, all I've seen, I saw a beautiful sunset. And he said, I heard one word from God. And I said, what was that? He said, mercy, mercy. 
And folks, I'm going to tell you, that's what it boils down to. This is the whole thing with Jacob, the mercy of God, who said, I, will, I want you to get your eyes on who I am. And if you want, Jacob said, please, tell me who you are. And the Lord wouldn't answer him. But folks, because of the cross, we found the answer. We know who he is now. He's mercy. I wouldn't be here. You wouldn't, oh, God knows I wouldn't be here without his mercy. No one man would be here. Not any man, nobody in this choir. You would not be here now, but for the mercy of God. The mercy of God. God was merciful to Jacob. Oh, when I have received the prize, I've received the mercy of God in Christ Jesus, my Lord. Do you want to trust him? Are you ready to turn everything over to the Holy Spirit? He said, if you do that, I'm going to bring you out. And God rescued Jacob. Jacob was very faithful. Even to his dying day, he's leaning on his staff. And he's leaning on the Lord. Will you stand, please? Let me tell you what I believe the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart. Please remain where you're at. Please stay for just a few moments. Unless we interfere with the Holy Spirit's work. Some of you are not at this place called Peniel. You're at the place called Wit's End. Truthfully. At the end of your rope. You've been crying, Lord, I can't take it anymore. I can't go on. Something has to happen. I got I get letters from pastors, and that's what many are saying to me. Pastor Dave. Unless God intervenes, unless I see something from God's hand, what's the use of going on? I can't go on. And what they're saying, I might as well quit. But the Lord's allowed the crisis so that you will never again trust your flesh. You'll never again trust those feelings of the flesh. Feelings of fear and rejection and fear of all kinds that come. And that you can stand up and say, no, I'm in the mercy of Christ. I'm going to trust him. And if you'll trust him through this crisis, if you trust him, you're going to find faith flood your soul. He's going to prepare you for things that may be beyond all of us. But you'll be ready because you say, live or die, I'm the Lord's. If you're here this morning and you're at wit's end, I'm not interested at all in flooding this altar and the aisles. Don't want you to come unless you say, Pastor Dave, I am at wit's end. I can't go on unless, and what's going to happen if you come? I want you to come to surrender. I want you to come and say, Lord, I want my heart changed. I want you to give me a dependent spirit, not a spirit of independence, but a spirit of dependence and confidence in you. Up in the balcony, go to the steps on either side, and in the annex, uh, I don't know if we'd have room down here. You, you can just go and stand between the screens. Just don't block the screen, but just if you'll stand, I'll pray for you there, and the Lord will hear you and hear me, and we'll agree together, and the Lord will do something for you this morning. If you don't know Christ, come also. If you've run from the Lord, you've grown cold and you've backslidden, you want to come back to your first love, get out of your seat and come and join these that are coming right now. Scripture says, reading from Psalm 86, Preserve my soul. And this is David speaking. For I am holy, O thou my God, save thy servant that trust in you. Be merciful to me, O Lord, for I cry daily to you. Rejoice the soul of your servant, for unto you, Lord, I lift up my soul. For you, Lord, are good, and you're ready to forgive, plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Give ear, O Lord, to my prayer. Attend to the voice of my supplication. In the day of my trouble, I'll call upon you, and you will answer me. In the day of my trouble, I'll call upon you, and you will. God, I ask now. Send your Holy Spirit and bring to our hearts an understanding of your mercy. You're not mad at your people. Lord, you, you said, yes, you demand full obedience to your word. 
but you give us power and authority to obey. Now, Lord Jesus, bring forgiveness, bring grace, and bring mercy to the hearts of those who've come. I want everyone who came forward to raise both hands. Just raise both hands. Lord, pray this prayer with me now. Lord, Lord I, love I love you, and I thank you, thank you. for knowing where I'm at, Lord, and you know what I'm going through. And I bring all my problems. I bring my situation. I bring my fears. I bring them to you. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, to give faith to me that I may trust God. I will give up trying to solve my problems. And I will call upon the Lord. Sanctify me by your Spirit. God, I want to trust you. Come now. And assure me with peace and rest in the Holy Spirit. Listen to me now, please. Hosea, when he was talking about Jacob, he said he prevailed with God with great tears and supplication, brokenness and pleading with God, prayer and brokenness before the Lord. And God wants you to do that. That's, that's, it's, it's not just saying, well, I believe. Jacob prevailed. The Bible said he was weeping all through that time. It may not be just tears and self, but a brokenness in the heart. Saying, Lord, forgive me for supplanting you. Forgive me for trying to replace you. So let there be times of prayer daily where you seek the Lord. Follow through on that. Take your burden to the Lord. That means go to prayer. Seek Him with all your heart. Don't be afraid to cry in His presence. Don't be afraid of tears. And let Him come and comfort your heart by His Spirit. Now, Lord, I pray for those who may have slipped away from you, they've grown cold or distant from you. You said, return, go back to your first love, your first works. And we pray that you'll do that right now. Thank you for your presence, Lord. We don't have to whip something up. We don't have to work something up. We simply trust the work of the Holy Spirit this morning. And everyone within the sound of my voice, in the annex, standing between the screens, and those in the audience, and those in the audience here, and in the choir, wherever it may be, Lord, we make a declaration right now that we thank you for bringing us to a place where we have things out of our own hands. Will you thank him now for taking things out of your hands?